Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. Alexander Zverev is Rome champion for the second time in his career. He wins his eighth big title, his 22nd overall. It secures him a top four seed at Roland Garros, which is actually an important one. Of course, you kind of avoid the big guns until the semifinals if you get into that top four, which Zverev has done. And as important as that is, it's probably not even quite as important as the confidence factor where, you know, Zverev now goes into Paris. You'd think with the necessary belief that he can win the whole thing. Hadn't been having the kind of clay court season that he'd want to up until this point, but now he wins his first title of the year at the perfect time in order to kind of maximize that confidence heading into the French Open. Speaking of which, Roland Garros power rankings will be a separate video tomorrow. I want to give it a lot of time, a lot of thought. This is probably the most important French Open power rankings, the one coming up, because not much is going to change after Geneva, realistically. So I'm going to do a whole long thing. That'll be tomorrow. Uh, I will get into how I feel about Zverev's Roland Garros chances on this episode of Monday Match Analysis. And I'll talk about Jari. Congratulations to him. Biggest final ever. Terrific run. Uh, great win over Tsitsipas in the quarters and Tommy Paul in the semis, and I'll talk about a little bit at the end about how I see him right now as a player. But I want to jump right into the match. Not, in my opinion, the most entertaining match, but it was a performance that I really admired from Alexander Zverev. I thought he was excellent. Score line, 6 4 7 5. But I always feel like with these matches, the matches that play out like the one, the, like the way this did, not quite as close as the score line suggests. Let me put it to you this way. Zverev won 90% of his service points. He did not face a break point. Meanwhile, Jari only broken twice, but he faced break point in five separate service games. So he was under the gun on a pretty regular basis. No pressure on Zverev's serve. And that's why I, I never really felt like Jari had an opening Maybe there was one. In fact, there was one. And this was the only time in the match, the only moment in the match, where it felt like Nico might have something going. Like there was daylight for him to maybe take a set. It was 30 all, 4 all in the second. Two spectacular shots by Jari to get to that point. 30 all points. Zverev hits this short backhand slice. Jari misses this low midcourt forehand. Kind of an awkward shot for him, especially if you don't fully trust your volleys. It's a it's a strange shot to hit. And Jari, he does a little bit better when the ball is upstairs above uh, hip level. 40-30, uh, service winner Zverev. That was it. Like That was the only moment for Jari. So I felt like it was Zverev all over this match from start to finish. Why was it Zverev? The entire time, one-way traffic. I'll break that down right after this. The biggest names in tennis are coming to Paris for the most anticipated French Open in years, and Tennis Channel Plus is your place to watch. Stream every court from your smart TV or your phone live in HD. Experience three weeks of unparalleled tournament access as the world's top players in tennis face off against each other. Will the veteran champions continue their dominance or will a fresh face emerge to continue their legacy on the clay courts? Daily live coverage of this epic showdown begins Monday, May 20th. Don't miss a matchup. Stream it now with Tennis Channel Plus to be there when it all happens. So dominant for Zverev, but was it a dud performance from Jari? I don't think so. I think two things are true. I think it's a terrible matchup for Jari. And I think it was a near-perfect performance from Zverev. So let's start with the matchup part. Jari kills you with relentless pace. He stays in attack. He hits huge off of both wings. He takes the ball relatively early, although he doesn't mind backing up behind the baseline. But he slugs it from there. So you just don't have a lot of time. He's an offensive guy. We all know that. But how is he offensive? He looks to drive the ball through the court. He's basically trying to put a hole right through you. Zverev is an elite shock absorber. Pace does not hurt him. 
What can hurt him? If you're trying to find finishes and break through Zverev's defense, it, it's very similar to the kind of thing we talk about with Medvedev. Another great shock absorber who likes to retreat far behind the baseline. You got to use angles. You got to use drop shots. You got to net rush and hit short volleys. And all of these things are crucial to try to force errors and find winners against Alexander Zverev. None of those things are really Jari's bread and butter. Jari wants to blast it through you. I think Zverev loves matchups when he feels like he can win the match without having to take big risks from the baseline. When he doesn't feel like he needs to force the issue because he's facing someone who is going to hit themselves into errors, that's where Zverev normally turns around and plays unbelievably clean in these matchups. I've seen it time and time again when he's playing a hyper-offensive player who is being proactive and looking to make something happen. And that play style, it just comes with more mistakes. That is when Zverev battens down the hatches, goes full lockdown, and keeps a clean sheet. And that's what he did in this match. So ultimately, I just felt like Zverev could play to his strengths, and he did so brilliantly. No mistakes, tough defense, good depth, because... You can try to shock absorb all you want. You can try to play consistent all you want. If you drop the ball short against Jari, he is going to destroy you. It doesn't matter how fast you are or how good a pace absorber you are. So, you know, depth is always key. And I did find that Zverev on his cross-court forehand was above his average in terms of uh, depth control. And on the backhand, he always keeps it deep. He always does a good job of that. That's kind of the baseline part of it. There's also the serving part of it. I mean, Zverev served incredibly well. And that is that was going to be tough for Jari. Nico ranks 38th among top 50 players at winning first serve return points this year. He is not great against the first serve. And unfortunately for Jari, Zverev made... 80% of his first serves. And it was untouchable. It was really clear really early on that Jari was, was struggling to handle the pace and the quality of the Zverev serve. Early on in the match, I wrote in my notes, can Jari actually return this thing? Because it felt like most of the match, he, he just couldn't. I mean, Zverev won 37 of 39 first serve points, 95%. It wasn't an ace fest. Ace rate, 12%. It's pretty standard for Zverev. It is, in the overall grand scheme of things, very good. Uh, but not, not off the charts. Six aces spread across two sets. Throw in 16 service winners. You do get a pretty high percentage of serves unreturned. 44% serves on return. So there were a very healthy number of service winners for Zverev, which, again, it suggests that Jari was having trouble dealing with the bombs raining down off of Sasha's first delivery. And the percentage was huge. As I said, 80%. Now, that is an above-average first serve performance by Zverev by quite a distance. But when I say above-average for Zverev, you also have to keep in mind that that particular average is the best average. Season average for Zverev on the first serve, 73.7%. 73.7%. Highest on tour. And if you look at the other big servers, I'm going to name a few right now. Hercotch is 64. Bublik is 60. Fritz is 63. FAA is 63. The only guy in Zverev zip code is Eubanks, who's also above 70. Kyrios is another guy who has been impressive in first serves in, if you go to 2022, best year of Kyrios' career, 68% first serves in. It's still five percentage points below Zverev at 73.7% this year. That's insane. 
how is he so much better than everybody else, all of these big servers? I think there are a couple things. First of all, Zverev serve is elite. Full stop, he's just great at serving. So in, in a way, I don't want to overcomplicate things, but then you can take other elite servers. You can take a guy like Hercoc, for example. I do think if Hercoc wanted to be at 73.7%, he could be there. But Hercoc is hunting for aces. That's his mindset on the first serve. So he's going to try to hit that 130 first serve to precise locations. He's going for the corners. He's going for the the sharp angles. He, he doesn't want you to touch the ball. And as a result, he's going to miss more. 64% is his percentage for the year. That's very good. But uh, I, I do think that he, he trusts his second serve. He doesn't necessarily trust his plus one forehand. So he feels like the best way for him to operate is to try to hit as many aces as possible. For Zverev, it's a different calculus. He, I think, very much trusts his ground game. He's not afraid to get into a rally. So he doesn't feel the need to overextend himself to hit aces, but also he does not trust his second serve. So I think he's found this great balance, and I'm, I'm a big believer that Zverev's sacrifice that he's making, which is he's not always going to hit really great spots on his first serve, but he's going to hit really, really big first serves, and he's going to make them. I, I think the calculus for him is super sound, and in a match like this, he didn't need to hit great spots because Jari couldn't handle the pace. And at the end of the day, Jari needs to be offensive off of the return in order for him to have success. I mean, the, the reason Nico Jari is a dangerous tennis player is because when he has time on the ball and when, when he can step kind of into his shots and be aggressive off the ground, it's overwhelming. It's unbelievable. That's hard to do on first serve return points. And that's why he's 38th among the top 50 players against the first serves throughout the season. Because you're not going to be in an offensive position after returning an 130 mile per hour first serve. It's usually not going to happen for you. Jari can do it occasionally, but he really needs second serves. And not once did he get second serves, especially not in bunches. I mean, heck, he never got second serves to look at all match, if we're being honest. Uh, and, and that was always going to be tough for him as a guy who relies on offensive returning. See, this match is pretty simple, you know, and this is going to be probably one of the shorter episodes of Monday Match Analysis because it, it's just one of those matches where, first of all, there weren't a lot of twists and turns and, you know, new developments that occurred from start to finish in the match. It was pretty much the same the whole time. So that always cuts down on the complications. But also, um, I just think it, it wasn't a complex match to, to wrap your head around. Um, that is kind of the Zverev serve against the Jari return, which was a mismatch. In terms of Zverev on return, you know, Jari certainly had a lot of really good moments on serve and he was able to dominate at times with his aggressive ground stroking behind his serve. I do think, I know I said that it wasn't his bread and butter, but I, I thought there was some good drop shotting at times from Jari. And at net, he was actually very efficient despite not being up there all that much, probably could have been up there a little bit more, uh, but, but he was very efficient finishing at least easy volleys at net. Um, the problem was there were games where Jari missed first serves, and this happened towards the end of sets, and the arm got a little bit tight, you felt a little more tension, and then the forehand got erratic. So no free points because there's missed first serves and Zverev was making more first serve returns anyway, but he's getting second serve looks. He's not going to miss that return. It's going to be deep in the court. And then Zverev is going to stay in great defensive position, which means he doesn't run around his backhand to hit forehands really 
unless he has a chance to step inside the court to do it, like he did on the match point off of the short slice. He is going to stay behind the baseline, even if there is an offensive sacrifice there. Even if Zverev knows that if he's going to stand eight feet behind the baseline and Jari surrenders a short ball, Sasha can't attack it as well. That is a sacrifice he is willing to make because he feels it's more important to stay in good defensive position as to not give Jari an easy way to win the points with his power. So essentially, um, stay in possession, stay in position, keep it deep, wait for the miss. And that's all it was. So I'll, I'll run you through these breaks of serve. Four or five in the first set. Jari misses three out of his five first serves. He makes three attacking forehand unforced errors. And he doesn't get a single cheap point with his serve. Every serve he hits comes back in this game. Five, six, second set. There were... Uh, it, it was not quite as simple. There were some, some good plays made by Zverev in this return game. Uh, but it was a lot of the same. First... You had a dip in first serve percentage. Jari was good for the match. Jari was 68% for the match, but in this game, he only made four out of eight. He makes three attacking errors. One was off of a plus one backhand down the line. Uh, two were off of his forehand. And he only gets one cheap point out of the eight that were played in the game. So that's what went wrong for Jari and it's not the easiest, I, I'll say this, like, it's not the flashiest praise for Zverev, but I can't emphasize enough how well he did the whole counterpunching thing in this match. He just didn't miss anything other than 4-5 in the second set where I think Zverev actually got tight and made two neutral unforced errors. He was rock solid other than that. And I don't have the, the overall stats for the match, but I do have in the first set... He was nine winners to two unforced errors, but some of the, let's see, four of those nine winners were aces. So you can just see from that how, how um, his approach was off of the ground. He was not in a position to really create winners, but he also wasn't committing unforced errors. So it would have been um, off the ground. It would have been five winners to two unforced errors. Um, that's all I have on the final. As I said, let's keep this simple. Jari couldn't handle Zverev's first serve. Zverev was really, really, really consistent. And with the, with the way Jari struggled to hurt him because of the, the quality of return and the pace absorption skills and the defensive skills of Zverev, Jari just couldn't keep up the consistency with the volume of balls that were coming back into the court. All right. Uh, where do I stand on Zverev for Roland Garros? People are going to pick him to win it. I think. I think people will pick him to win it. I get why. The top looks vulnerable, meaning Djokovic, Sinner, Alcaraz. And Zverev just won Rome. He has made three straight Roland Garros semifinals. He has four clay Masters titles to his name. Tsitsipas can't say that. Rude can't say that. And just watching him this week, I mean, anyone who is closely observing Zverev would have seen one thing that's been the same all year, which is his serve is monstrous. But then the, the forehand part of it, that's the most positive because that's really the barometer of for his game, always has been. We know he is rock solid in the backhand to backhand exchange. Forehand to forehand, a lot of the best players in the world can overpower him when he's not threatening with his forehand down the line and when his depth and his speeds kind of fall off from where they need to be at an elite level. But uh, throughout this Rome run, Zverev was taking his forehand down the line with a lot more confidence than is sometimes the case. And it looked like he, he was hitting through the court with uh, a good amount of penetration and higher speeds than maybe we're used to. Here are the negatives. I'm less enthused by this particular Rome title run than just about any Rome run that I can remember. 
which is not really a surprise given the circumstances. Kind of expected a Rome that was going to be somewhat atypical, just looking at how the draw played out. You, you had the, the injuries to Alcaraz and Sinner. You had Rublev coming off of an illness. You had Medvedev potentially with a health issue, which turned out to maybe not be such a big factor for Medvedev. There were openings in the draw, especially when the Djokovic root quarter broke down. Then you're thinking, okay, wow, that's another quarter that, that might get a little bit funky. And that was the quarter I thought might be more chalky. So it's not surprising that this Rome draw was not quite as difficult to navigate through as many have been in recent years because Rome has typically been an incredibly tough tournament to win. You have the proximity to Roland Garros. You have the way the conditions tend to simulate Paris a lot better than, say, a Madrid. So you've always had the top guys kind of bring their A game to Rome at least in general, well, Zverev just had to beat one player in my Roland Garros power rankings, the last edition, which was Taylor Fritz, who came in at number nine, and he had no top 10 wins. Now, I'll count the Fritz thing as almost a honorary top 10 win because I have Fritz power ranked in the top 10. You look at recent Rome runs, let me go through them. Djokovic last year beat Rude and Tsitsipas. Nadal the year before beat Sinner, Zverev, and Djokovic. 2020, Djokovic won. He beat Rude and Schwartzman, which on paper sounds a little bit soft, but Diego was actually top five clay court player in the world in 2020, ended up making the RG semis a couple weeks later. 2019, Nadal beat Tsitsipas and Djokovic. 2018, another year Nadal won it. He beat Djokovic and Zverev. And then here's where I'll stop. Zverev won it in 2017, and he beat Djokovic in the final. Raonic and Isner in the rounds before, which was kind of funny to look back on, a little bit surprising. Uh, but yeah, I mean, generally, it's a lot harder to win Rome. Uh, Zverev had one of the easiest, had the easiest path in recent memory, uh, which I wouldn't hold against him. And I don't really hold against him. Obviously, you can't control that, but I'm, I'm trying to kind of... I'm I'm trying I guess what I'm trying to get at is usually when someone wins Rome I it really changes the way I think about their Roland Garros chances and for Zverev it certainly does to an extent all I'm saying is it it does less than winning Rome usually does if that makes sense especially because there isn't quite enough outside of the Rome run first title of the year first big title since fall of 2021 now, of course, second half of 2022 was a wash because he couldn't play. First half of 2023 was a little bit difficult for him as well because he was still working his way back. But still, fall 2021, a long time ago, since his last big title, at least for Zverev, you know, in the context of Zverev's career. Now, let's talk about 2021 because I, I do want to make a point about that as well. 2021, Zverev beats Djokovic, wins the Olympics, skips Canada, Goes to Cincinnati, looks dominant in Cincinnati, wins it. Nadal pulls out of the U.S. Open. Djokovic has the Grand Slam on the line, but looked mentally rattled at the Olympics and took the entire North American hardcourt swing off. So there was a little bit mister a little bit of mysteriousness seeping in for Djokovic, even though he had won the previous three slams. And obviously you have the question of the pressure. How is Novak going to handle the pressure? Which I, I I knew coming in was going to be a big deal. I didn't pick Djokovic to win the US Open uh coming in. I picked Medvedev, and then I ended up pick changing my pick right before the final. Cause I just once once there's only one match left for the Grand Slam, I just couldn't bring myself to not think he was going to do it. I don't know why. But anyway. Um you know, th there was a lot of thought that Zverev could win the U.S. Open. And that was the last time, that was probably before right now, the last time I think you would have found people whose opinion was that Zverev was going to win a slam. I felt the same way then that I do now. I don't want to belabor this point. I know I've said it before. But even, you know, that was a time where he looked like the best player in the world for three months leading up to a slam, which hasn't really been the case here, but it was the case there. I still didn't care because I don't know that the nerves are going to hold up at the end of a major. And I still don't know that. And I still don't think that. 
because it's the kind of thing where he's got to prove it to me. Uh, by the way, 2021 U.S. Open, he lost to Djokovic in a five-set semifinal, lost at 6-2 in the fifth. He was down two sets to one, um, won the fourth, lost the fifth. So personally, I haven't decided who I'm picking to win. But I can tell you right now, it won't be Zverev. Because I have no reason to believe that the mental stuff that has held him back in the past is no longer an issue. Now, in fairness to Zverev, I don't know that there's anything he could do to show me that the mental stuff is no longer an issue other than win a slam. And that's why I've kind of accepted the fact that if Zverev ever wins a major, I won't, I almost definitely will not have predicted it before the tournament. And I'm, you know, I'm at peace with that. Uh, one other thing on Zverev, and then I'm going to get to Jari. No matter what happens at Roland Garros, there will be off-court storylines with Zverev coming up. Uh, the first date of his domestic abuse trial is May 31st. Middle of the French Open, Sasha is not required to be there. Uh, there are kind of multiple court dates that will be spread across the next couple months thereafter. Uh, Zverev was issued a penalty order of 488,000 US dollars. A penalty order is issued when evidence is so compelling that a judge deems a trial unnecessary. However, you can appeal the penalty order or contest it, which is what Zverev has done, and that triggers the trial. The final date of the trial is July 19th. So we won't have any closure until then. I don't know how, you know, I don't know if details from the trial are going to be spilling out during Roland Garros or not um, in terms of, you know, is it is it a public trial? Uh, to what extent is it a public trial? I don't know any of these things, but I uh, just wanted to put that information out there as it will be a storyline that is coming around the pipeline and anything that Zverev does on court is is going to be paired with the serious trial that is about to be ongoing that is starting in a, in you know next week as for Jari um kind of his breakthrough run here although you know he's won two titles on tour and uh you know he even made a final earlier this year never at a big event like this and, I mean, it was stunning. It was stunning at times from Jari. When he was relaxed, when he was in the zone, it was pretty insane. It kind of reminded me of Prime Team, the way he was throttling the ball from the back, maintaining absurd forehand speeds. Like, when, when they were taking the averages, and I always feel there's a difference between what Tennis Insights comes up with and what Hawkeye comes up with, but, like, you know, it, it was across the board in the Tsitsipas match, Jari's average forehand speed was somewhere between 85 and 89 miles per hour. Totally unheard of. It, un, off the charts. So we got into a rhythm off that forehand that was pretty insane. Again, reminded me of prime Dominic team. Tsitsipas and Paul susceptible to that pace. You know, they both have particular run, uh, wings in which they are rushable on. Tommy Paul, the forehand, I think he got pushed around quite a bit. Uh, and Tsitsipas more so on the backhand when he runs up against this upper echelon of weight of shot. The only problem I saw with Jari, even in those matches, was the nerve management. When he gets tight, he gets a little wild on the forehand. Sometimes the positioning is off, but I actually think that you can sometimes see just that arm tighten up and he just can't let it go uh, like he normally does. And there's also some bad decisions that come in for Jari. You know, maybe an irresponsible net approach, a drop shot uncalled for, you know, something like that. You know, it's just, it seems like he does have a little bit of kind of panicky tendencies when he gets nervous, but he does compete very hard. When it's great, it's great. That's the thing with Jari. Like, his game is huge in every area, and when when he's on, he won't give you a ton of mistakes relative to the amount of aggression that he's bringing to each and every point. When he's off, it's a different story. I think this stat kind of sums it up well. Jari is 3-2 and two against top 10 players this year. He is 8-8 eight eight against players outside the top 50. 
I understand the sample sizes are different there, but as of now, Jari has a higher win rate against top 10 players than he does against players outside the top 50. And I think that gives you a pretty good idea of who he is as a player, for better or worse. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.